Thank you, worship team. Can we show our worship team some love? I love them so much. Incredible. Thank you, friend. How are we? We good? Yeah? Um, hey, let me, let me just say, I just really want to encourage you guys. I, I can't even tell you this morning how hard it was to pull those covers off. <laughs> I was so cozy at Comforter. I mean, I, I, I'm here because I work here. <laughs> but you're here because you chose to be here with the people of God, with the Spirit of God, and the house of God. And I just want to tell you I love you. That's, that's incredible. And so I also want to welcome those of us that are watching online that <laughs> you weren't willing to brave the weather, and, uh, and I don't much blame you, but we still love you. We're grateful for you. Can we show them some room love? Yes, and those that are in the chapel. By way of beginning, I have a very, very special announcement, but I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to have my very dear friend. Come. Is he not here? Oh, there he is. Oh, him and her. Come on up. For those of you that do not know who this man is, he's iconic around here at Lighthouse Church, and this is Mr. Alan Sowers. He is who takes the backpack. Love you, buddy. And um, brought some backpacks in tow, and you're gonna tell us a little bit about what you're doing, how God's using you, and uh, why wow, we're so grateful for you. Take it away, partner. Testing? Yep. All right. Good morning. It's great to be here. Amen? <laughs> Amen. In spite of the weather and everything, all right. Um, we're just going to talk about a, a couple things in our ministry that we are so excited about, but I want to start by just saying thank you so, so much for your participation in the sponsorship program, and thank you so much for packing these backpacks. Uh, as you can tell, my daughter would not allow me, this is Kirsten, uh, my daughter would not allow me to carry them up. She said, Dad, you better protect your back. Uh, so here she is, I'm just making excuses. Uh, but anyhow, uh, we are just so excited to, to be here and for our partnership with you. Uh, we partner with indigenous pastors, trying to empower them. That is what our ministry really is about. And so whenever you're packing a backpack and you're, you're sponsoring those kids, that's what you're really doing. You're trying to, to partner with those indigenous pastors. And I'm just going to give you just a two-minute uh, rundown of what it is that we do, uh, just a few of our projects. We have more projects, but I'm going to just give you a quick a project. So I want you to imagine with me for just a moment that you live up on a mountain way up in Honduras, and it's really rough terrain, and there is no road that actually gets to your house, to your village. Oh. It's just a path. And you have this desire not only to plant a church in your community, but you want to plant a church in that community down over there. You can see it, but it's a 10-mile walk. Or maybe there's one over there, and so you want to plant that church. And so we've come along with 400 pastors and helped them get a motorcycle. Huh. No, we don't give them to them. We help them get a motorcycle. And for those who couldn't afford a motorcycle or they couldn't afford to put the fuel in, uh, we've helped 70 pastors get a horse or a mule. Uh, so that's one of the projects we do. We have a pastor's training school, and a lot of our pastors have not had an education, a, a good uh, uh, biblical education. And so we've had 125 pastors graduate from a three-year program that we have down there. And we've have, thank you. We have another 80 that are right now attending that pastor's training school. Uh, we do church construction. So most of our churches start out as home plants mm. and they just start out as just a, you know, a Bible study and, you know, as a, as a, as a cell group or whatever you want to call it, uh, a small group. And then they start growing and maybe it was pastor led and maybe it was uh, uh, some lady that was visiting from the village next door or whatever. Maybe she walked that 10 miles and every week she would walk over there and share the gospel. But it starts out as that and then you get this knock on the door. Uh, brother, could you help us build a church? And so we've done 200 churches huh. in this manner. Incredible. So, and then the final one I'm gonna share with you, the final project I'm gonna share with you is Bibles. Whenever we arrived in Gracias, uh, uh, almost 20 years ago now, uh, we found out that almost not a single pastor had more than what I'd call a plain Jane Bible. Sorry if your name's Jane. Uh, but uh, just a basic Bible. 
you know, a very simple Bible. And so we wanted to get the, the pastor's study materials and study Bibles and commentaries. And I bet you if you go into Sammy's li- uh, uh, office, he has a whole library totally. of books, totally. you know, that he can, he can uh, tie into and look at. And so we wanted to make that. So to date, we have done 60,000 huh. Bibles, primarily Bibles, but also Bible study materials that we've worked with those pastors. So again, as you're, as you're partnering with us, as you're doing the sponsorship program with us, I want you to think about that and say, uh, you know, we're not just sponsoring a kid. Mm. We're sponsoring this whole ministry. We're working alongside this whole ministry to try to empower these pastors to share the gospel up huh. there in the mountains of Honduras. And we just appreciate that so much. And even more, even more, we appreciate your prayers. And before I forget, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to, work this in somehow. We have coffee back in the back, uh, um, and uh, they're selling coffee back in the back that came from our coffee farm, so I'm supposed to work that in. So, but (laughs) back to the prayer. Would you please pray for us? Thank you so much. Amen. Let me just say that, uh, Mr. Allen, that's, that's, that's what you call real deal Holyfield right there. I mean, he does church in the wild. And when it comes to the United States of America, we're able to luxuries and some pleasantries when it comes to church. Many times you can do church sort of like two-wheel drive around here. When you get into Honduras doing what he does, that's church four-wheel drive all day, every day. I'm not just talking about the landscape. I'm talking about just the grit, the tenacity, the endurance. And brother, I just wanna say thank you for being rung out for the gospel. You're doing it. You're doing it. We love you. I also want to commend the church. We, um, over the course of the last several months, if you are not aware, we raised over 1,000 backpacks that will go down to Honduras to give to the children down there. So thank you for your generosity and the way that we're supporting the Sours. Second, I got three announcements. That was one. Number two, number two. Uh, This past week, we launched our fall church merch line, which we called it LH Core Merch. Come on, somebody. And so for some of y'all, we, uh, we, we, I've been watching you. Y'all need some fresh swag. Well, we got you. We got you, baby. And um, this, this season, we've done something altogether unique. We've chosen white and black colors. <laughs> The unique part of these are they got black words on them. Uh Uh-huh, these are great conversation starters, high quality, all right? Um, And so they're not thin, they're gonna keep you warm. This is a wonderful shirt to wear while you're watching football in the afternoon or you're out uh, just, just making much of Jesus, okay? And so you can get that out in the foyer as well. And um, some of y'all need this. Some of y'all need this, okay? That's number two. Number three, today commences a big one. This is a big one. And that is at the conclusion of our Exodus series, we are going to have a good old fashioned hoedown baptism in the house. And I'm not talking about baptism like we typically do where it is out here, even though that is altogether incredible. This is in service, two tubs, men and women declaring that their lives have been changed by Jesus, being buried in a watery grave, raised the new in Christ Jesus, testimonies to follow. And so today is the, is the beginning of the sign up. So you can register for that. You can go to the seat back in front of you, little QR code, you can register. You can go out here to our welcome center. Let me just say this, as your brother and as your pastor, if you have not taken that next step, yet you have declared your life to Jesus, surrendered your own to follow his will, but you have not followed the obedient action call to be baptized, this is your opportunity. This is where you publicly display and you put it on blast that I am on team Jesus. And there is something altogether incredible that transpires in that moment. And so I know there would, for some of us, be a timidity or a reservation. Let me just say, get over it because we wanna celebrate with you and we wanna see Jesus active in your life by following him obediently in the call to be baptized, amen? And so go to the QR code, go to the Welcome Center, whatever information you need to get you comfy, there's gonna be classes that lead up to, that's October the 29th. And so we wanna celebrate with you, amen? And so with that, I'm gonna pray, we're gonna get to work. Oh yeah, I got all the time in the world. 
Three o'clock's a long way off. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for you. We're grateful for the joy that comes when your people gather in your house with your spirit, with one another. Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts to receive what your word would show us. We need you, Lord. So we need your activity in our lives. We need you to shape and to mold the stretch and to reveal how awesome you are. We wanna love you better. We wanna leave here changed. Father, that only happens through your Holy Spirit's activity. Come and do what only you can do. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. And all God's people said... Amen. As of late, I've had this sort of awareness that um, I I feel like I carry in and out of uh, really any conversation that I have, any counseling session that I walk into, um, listening to people, experiencing different sort of dynamics of listening to people's stories, struggles that they have, the heartache that they have, the wins that they have. No matter the context, what I've come to realize is, is that God has created us in such a way that there is a common thread that runs through all of us that then results in a required need. That all people, no matter the diversity, or the ethnicity, or the background, or the like, No matter what, we all have the same need. And this isn't gonna be an aha moment for many of us. This isn't gonna be a a mind blower, but I just wanna sort of crystallize the thought that we all need to feel loved. Uh, We all need to feel at certain moments and seasons, we need to feel encouraged. We need to feel like there's people that support us and believe the best is ahead of us. We need people that is in our corner that we are truly convinced really sincerely care for us. We need to feel loved. You starve somebody of love and they're gonna go sideways quick. Many times that's a result of our experiences, our backgrounds, the struggles that we're enduring or the own inner narrative that we run over and over and over again in our mind's eye. It's the criticisms that we have of ourselves. It's the fiery darts shot at us by the enemy. We need to feel loved. And what's incredible when you think about our great need for love, many times there's a diversity in how we really resonate with love or how one ultimately interprets love. Uh, Years ago, uh, a doctor, a psychologist by the name of Dr. Gary Chapman wrote a book called The Five Love Languages, where it was his experience and his study where he realized that many times when it comes to people, we have five love languages. One really resonates with you. The other are sub to that. But these five love languages sort of create the gamut. Those five are, there's some that really resonate with words of affirmation. There's some that really resonate with getting gifts. There's some that really resonate with physical touch. There's some that resonate with quality time. There's some that really resonate with, fifthly, acts of service. These are the five love languages. Truth be told, in a room this size, and even those that are watching online, all of us have sort of a primary love language. And this is what really meets the need, if you will. This is what really fills the void. This really ministers to us. When I think of my wife, uh, my wife is uh, first and foremost, it is acts of service. Oh, she loves acts of service. It really goes well for me when there's acts of service. Second is words of encouragement. Ruth loves words of encouragement. And then thirdly, she loves quality time. You can rack and stack them. And on any given day, they change, but... Primarily, her her big one is acts of service. I remember my father, my father uh, loved words of encouragement. You couldn't encourage him enough. And then he loved gifts. And then he loved acts of service. But if you're really gonna minister to him, it was words of encouragement. When it comes to me, mine is, um, if you were to rack and stack my, my first three primarily, it would be physical touch. Second would be touch me again. Third would be touch me one more time. Right in there. (laughs) <laughs> Ruth would love for me to grow in diversity in my love language. I told me, work with me, girl, work with me. This is what, I'm pretty simple. 
And all the men in the house said, amen. <laughs> There's a problem though. There's a problem that though they be the five primary love languages, one that res really resonates with us all, um, there's a problem. And the problem is what I would call a pre-existing disposition. Due to our carried pre-existing disposition, sometimes we misinterpret love. Sometimes because of the lens that we look through, the experience that we had, the heartache that we've endured, the, the trauma that we've undergone, the upbringing that we witnessed, many times it creates a disposition. And when that disposition is sort of rooted in your person, people can come and try to love you, even minister to you, but because of said disposition, you don't understand it or see it as love. This is especially true of those that have been through trauma, those who have been deceived, those who have been abused. Many times their disposition is they're so guarded or so at arm's length or so suspect that even when people try to love them, they can't because the way it's being interpreted. I bring this up because this is incredibly imperative that we recognize this because if we don't, what happens is not only do we carry that disposition in and out of relationships, but moreover, we carry that disposition in our relationship with God. Where God will try to love us, God will try to help us, God will try to bless us, God will try to protect us. And if we have a wrongful disposition, oh, we won't see it as love. Actually, we'll see it as God is against us or God must be absent of us or God must not be for us. Why? Many times it's not because of the way that he's loving, it's the way we're interpreting it. You ask, okay, so, so what are these dispositions? These dispositions are really common. They're very common and, and know this, they're by and large rooted in sin because of our fallen nature, because of our depravity, and because of our waywardness, we cultivate these dispositions and we don't even know it. So then we have these internal sort of intrinsic paradigms that we look through, and then God tries to come and love us in the way he knows best, and we don't see it as such. These dispositions can be anything from selfishness. You've just cultivated selfishness where it's all about you. I mean, you live here, everybody else is extras in the plot. You know, the whole you know, universe orbits around you and your wants and your comfort and your likes. So when somebody tries to come and love you, it's gotta be through the vein in which you determine that's how I wanna be loved. Why? Because you're selfish. For those of us that have cultivated pride and arrogance, ego and the like, oh, you got a very thin sort of paradigm of how you like to be loved. You don't like to be pulled out of yourself. You don't like to be shown different ways. You don't like to be reproved. Oh, no, 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 no. Love has to happen like this. When it comes to those of us that constantly murmur and complain, I know nobody in this room does that, but for some people, they do do that. Isn't that crazy? I don't know anybody like that. But they murmur and complain all the day long, and then they cultivate this ungratitude in their heart or this entitlement in their heart. And so when it comes to love, oh, that comes through, that has to come through a very thin vein for them, or they don't see it as love when it comes to those of us that are bound to addictions, that are yoked, that are living with secrets and hidden sins and the like. Oh, oh, there's a paradigm that they look through. So love is interpreted very askew. When it comes to um, people that have created and oriented their whole life around being comfortable. Of course, this would be rooted in pride or this would be rooted in selfishness or this would be rooted in, in not being grateful. But for some of us, our whole day is spent with the mentality of what makes me comfortable? And anything that causes you discomfort, you see it as ignorant or mean when in fact it very well could be love. And I know that we, 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 we love the thought of love in concept. The problem is, is that many times we don't understand that God loves us in the way that he knows is best for us, oftentimes interpreted as 
unloving. And this is going to be especially true for the children of Israel that if we don't understand that God has a certain love language, that God has a certain way that he ministers to us, oh, it sets a whole perspective off. John did an incredible job last week sort of marching through all of the, 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 I mean, the intrinsic and the categorized ways that God walked through the, the, the children of Israel so as to get their liberation from the tyranny of not only Egypt, but moreover, Pharaoh himself. That God um, performed signs, wonders, miracles, by and large, by the way, of, of plagues, so as to buckle the knee of Pharaoh and finally... Pharaoh succumbs to the Lord's demand and says, liberate the children of Israel. 400 years, these people were under the oppression of the Egyptians. All they knew is the lifestyle that was provided for them under this oppressive regime. And so they were told when to work, where to work, and to hold their responsibilities. They were told when to eat, how to eat, and what to eat. They were told where to live, what community to have, and the liberties that they had therein. It was so oppressive, but this is all that they knew. This is all that they knew for generations and generations and generations and generations and generations. And now all of a sudden, God hears the cries of his people. He goes in and he liberates them, giving them this newfound freedom. And the scripture says something that is altogether incredible. Yet if you don't watch, you could just read right by it, not understanding the importance of it. It says this in chapter 13, beginning in verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. Stop right there. Notice this, that not only does God liberate us when he finds us, and know this, there's not a soul in this room that surrendered their life to Jesus that has not been liberated. I'm not just talking about an addiction or something that shackled you, or a yoke that, that, that like you couldn't stop doing. I'm even talking about those that God found you on the mountaintop. Everything was breaking in your favor, going great. Man, life was easy. You were in bondage to the deception that you were the be-all, end-all. You were in bondage to the deception that this is as good as it gets until you had it all only to realize this falls short. Then God liberates us from the lie, brings us into his marvelous light, pulls our feet out of the miry clay, sets it on a, on a solid rock and liberates us into this newfound freedom called the kingdom of God. There's not a soul in here that's not been liberated. And what's incredible about God is he doesn't just liberate us, he liberates us and then says, now I want to lead you. Notice that what he did with the children of Israel. He didn't say to them, okay, now you're free. Now you're unyoked. Now you're no longer under the oppression of Egypt. No, 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 no. Now you're free, and now I want you to follow me. The problem is, and, 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 and I know I might sound like commander obvious here, but the problem is this is the pivotal point right there. I've watched this time and time and time again, especially when it comes to addicts that are liberated, their addiction is broken, they step into this newfound freedom, and all of a sudden, because they don't follow God, because they don't follow the leader, it's in no time whatsoever that they're right back in the bondage that they were freed from. You've seen it. You've done it. I've done it. I got too many T-shirts to testify of it. This is what we do. God frees us, and then we just run right, right back to it. I got this, I got this big Doberman that I, that I love. I've come to really love. I didn't, I didn't like him to begin with, but Ruth did. And so Ruth's like, he's staying, you're going. I was like, all right, we'll keep him. I like shelter. So, so, so I've come to love my Doberman. His name's Sawyer. Sawyer is a dummy. I mean, he's, 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 he's a love bug, but, but he, he, he's dumb. And so what'll happen with Sawyer is I'll open the door. I got this big backyard and I like to walk him out there. I like to walk him out there and then he can run around. And, you know, he, he can't run too, too far because it's not that big of a backyard, but he can chase, you know, he sees a little rabbit, a little squirrel from time to time. He hits the jackpot, you know, jumps up a little deer. I mean, Sawyer's in hog heaven back there. So what I'll do is I'll open the door and think, okay, now Sawyer, follow me. 
follow me, and I'm gonna lead you back to the promised land. It's right in the backyard. Come on. Sawyer gets out of that front door. <laughs> now, this is when I don't have the shot collar on him. Sawyer gets out of that front door and snaps his neck to the right, snaps it to the left. He's thinking, which way to run? I just wanna run. Here's the problem with Sawyer. Sawyer can't run. Why? Because he's got a little torn ACL. So you can't run. And I'm not paying for you to get it repaired. <laughs> That's a true story. Too much, too much. So we just got to ginger your ACL. So you got to follow me. Sometimes when I see him snapping his neck, I go, hey, soy, soy, I'm going to buzz you. And when I buzz him, <laughs> he pees himself. So, <laughs> so Sawyer doesn't like to get buzzed. The problem is he gets out of that front yard. He knows what's going to happen. Either I'm going to hit you with the buzzer or you're going to be laid on the sofa for the next three days. That's what'll happen because he'll, he'll, he'll rupture something or yada, yada, yada. And then he's walking around like the old crooked rear end, you know, trying, asking me to help him up on the sofa. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. That was your fault. So Sawyer gets out and he runs rather than following me. Why do I tell you that? Because for many of us, we're just like Sawyer. We love to run without the leader. We love to go our own way tearing everything up in between. And then we finally come to our senses and go, I gotta go back in the house of the Lord. I gotta get with the spirit of God and the people of God and I gotta follow God. I've seen it time and time again and I've done it where we get out there and we don't follow the leader that liberated us. Why? Because we think we know best. God says, God says in this text, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was the shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God let the people around by the desert, or in Hebrew, the wilderness, watch this, road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid. And then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, because it sucketh, they camped at Etham. <laughs> had to, had to. Save your email. Here we go. On the edge of the desert, by day, the Lord went ahead of them. Listen to this. This is incredible. In a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light. So they could travel by day or night, neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Let me just say this. I want you to understand, as John so rightly said last week, so much in the book of Exodus is a type. It's a foreshadowing of not only Yeshua, but it's a foreshadowing of how God works with his people. And in this context, specifically how God loves his people. These six short verses scream the love of the father. Scream his detailed involvement, intentionally leading them, loving them, showing things to them. It screams love. But if you have a disposition and you approach it wrongly, you'll interpret it wrongly. This is how God loves his children. It's a type that shows us the love language of the Father. And so what I wanna do for just a moment, I wanna just give you three ways God loves us that at many times seem unorthodox to us. Nevertheless, this is God's love language. First and foremost, I want you to understand this, that many times God loves us by giving us smaller trials so as to avoid devastating trials. Many times the way that God loves his children is to walk us into or make allowance for smaller trials so that we avoid life devastating trials. Listen to the scripture. When Pharaoh let the people go, 
God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. Mind you, some scholars will conclude that actually this route that God said, let's go this route rather than the coastline of the Egyptian nation, I'm gonna take them through the wilderness, this would add weeks to their journey. Now, remember now, you're talking about two million people in tow. Two million Israelites now that are out, they don't even really know where they're going. They know that their ancestors and their patriarchs and what they thought for some of them, they were concluding this was folklore. They didn't know, they didn't know. But they thought, wait a minute, we've heard of this place called Canaan, this promised land that God told the prophets of old. And so we're just gonna follow Moses. But now this is all uncharted to them. And so now to get to Canaan, to get out of the nation of Egypt, they certainly would have thought, let's take the efficient route. Let's take the quick route. Let's roll. And so God seeing them, he knew otherwise. No, 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 I'm gonna circumvent that route. I'm gonna take them through this route. They got caravans, they have resources, they have armor, they have weapons, they have gold, they have women, they have children. And God said, no, 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 I can't let you go the shorter route. Why, says this, for God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert toward the Red Sea. The Israelites, check this, the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Actually in Hebrew, what that means is they were organized. It could have been that Moses and the leaders therein organized them in packs of like 50. They were battle ready. They had armor on that they had never worn before. They had swords and sheaths and weapons and the like. And now all of a sudden they feel like, wait a minute, wait a minute, let us at them. We're ready to rock. All the men are sort of, you know, chest out, shoulders back, chin up, ready to, okay, babe, watch, watch me work. They're out there. They think we can take on anyone. Why? They just saw the signs, wonders, and exploits of the Lord. They were ready on the outside. They weren't even close to ready on the inside. That God saw that you're, you're posturing well, but if you face battle without being prepared for it, you're gonna go right back to the place that held you captive. Let let, let, let me just fast forward for you, just so you understand the mentality that the Egyptians would take on. The Egyptians would begin to murmur so much that they actually accused Moses of bringing them out into the wilderness to die. They thought, what kind of ignorance and, and unloving act Would you liberate us from Egypt, bring us out here and not have all the pleasantries that we had back there? They actually started to romanticize about Egypt. Meanwhile, they were beaten back there. Meanwhile, they were scourged. They were murdered. They were oppressed. They were having work order. The whole nine yards, they got so comfortable in bondage, they couldn't even appreciate freedom. I've seen this, listen to me, friend. I have seen people that get free, get outside of of, of that which yoked them, and now they have freedom without boundaries, and it's so uncharted or so unfamiliar that the next thing they do is go right back into the thing that slaved them. Why? Because at times, bondage will create comfort. You just get so used to it, you can't imagine your life without it. And so people will go back to that which is familiar all to avoid that which is unknown. Understand this, when it comes to God, he loves you so much that he is as as interested in your preparation as he is in your destination. That he will not bring you to a place that your character can't keep you. He will not bless you with gifts that will hurt you. He has to do a work within you. For some of us, we find ourselves in a trial right now. You're in a waiting season. You've been told to wait. You don't know why you have to wait. It doesn't seem like the shortest route. 
It doesn't seem like the most efficient one. You don't know why you haven't been able to get pregnant. You don't know why you haven't been able to find a good man, find a good girl. You don't know why school's taken this long. You don't know why it's one bad relationship after another. You don't know why. And sometimes it's a result of sinful people and sometimes it's a result of God taking you through a smaller trial to keep you from a devastating one. God took them through a trial. I'm gonna tell you right now, we throw stones at the children of Israel. Had he walked me along the the, the longest route, I'd be like, no, 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 no. You know how you are when you pull something up on the GPS and you're like, you got long route or easy route and there's traffic on that route. You're like, I'll take the traffic. Why? Because we're like sheep. We'll always look for the path of least resistance. But the valley and the wilderness is where God forges character. This is why James, the brother of Jesus, says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work in the trial so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Hear me. Hear me, I know this sounds crazy. God loves us so much that he will walk you into a trial to shape you. That's what good parents do. They train their children. It's been thought of in 2023. Oh, if you're a good parent, you never say no. That's, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Or you don't punish or you don't reprove. No, 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 it's, it's constant, you know, affirmation. Get the heck out of here. That's why we're in turmoil like we are, little gremlins running around. Oh, because we're just gonna love them without training them. So, so, so let me tell you this, okay, the second service. I got time. <laughs> this is your fault, you should have stayed in bed. All right. When I got out of Bible college, I I, I just wanna tell you, this has shaped my life. When I got out of Bible college, I came home two weeks prior to graduating and I sat with my pastor, Pastor Jack Cox. I love him so much. And so Pastor Jack Cox is the one that really supported me through going through Bible college. He's the one that watched me go through Teen Challenge. He wanted me to go through Bible college. He financially helped me. And and so it was, I got out of Bible college and uh, two weeks prior to graduating, I came home to tell Pastor Jack, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come home, Pastor Jack, and I'm gonna marry Ruth. And then a month later, I'm going to San Diego, California. Why? Because the school that I went to secured a job for me in San Diego as a youth pastor making $40,000 a year. I thought I was gonna be rich. I was like, this is incredible. The promised land is on the West Coast and God's taken me there. And so I sat in his office. I'll never forget this day. It's vivid in my mind. I sat in his office and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm selling it. I'm telling them all about how, what God's done in me and how he's gonna use me and how I wanna set the world on fire for him. And and man, I mean, I'm breaking a sweat and pulling a hamstring and the whole nine yards. And he's not saying a word. He's just looking at me. And I was thinking, you know, as I was going, maybe this is all, you know, this is so incredible, he's speechless. (laughs) But he was like, he's not saying a word to me. And I was actually copping a little bit of an attitude. I'm gonna be honest with you. I was thinking, man, you know, be like, wow. Sammy, or this is an incredible dude, or man, bless God, none of that. So I get to the end and I'm like, <laughs> and I said, what, what, what do you think? And Pastor Jack, honest to goodness, I remember, leaned back in this big red tufted chair. He had his hands folded. He had them on his belly. He stared down at his hands, looked up at me. I was like, what is happening here? And his next words were, do you know what I think you should do? I was like, I didn't, I didn't ask. <laughs> I was here for my blessing. Just tell me to, tell me to go, it's San Diego. <laughs> We're in Glen Burnie, this is a no brainer. He goes, you know what I think you should do? He goes, I think you should come home and get a job working construction. <laughs> what? Did you just? <laughs> Are we in the same room? I just told you. He goes, and then long pregnant pause, honest to goodness. He goes, who knows, Sammy? Maybe one day you'll find yourself driving a piece of heavy machinery. (laughs) Period. (laughs) No more words. No more words. And then just looking at me. 
So I had to dig deep. I had to dig in a well that was running really dry. And I was so angry at his counsel. But I knew without a shadow of a doubt, that was the word of the Lord. I knew it. I knew that's what God just told me to do. I, I couldn't go to San Diego. I had to get, come home and get a job working construction. And I'd love to tell you that I had like this incredible character. I'm gonna tell you right now, there was a grace on my life to say yes. And here's why, because I was so scared of myself. I just got freed from heroin addiction. The only thing that I had accomplished is I had a star on the chore chart of finishing rehab and I finished, you know, three years of Bible college and I knew that's the word of the Lord. And so I came home, got a job working construction. If you wanna know what my job was, I started at the Ordnance Road Prison right here. Isn't God has such a sense of humor? As a laborer sweeping. And one day, about a year later, this gentleman six feet away from me threw me a set of keys and said, Sammy, get in that backhoe over there and drive around and pick up trash. <laughs> Almost had a worship service right in the dirt. Like, I knew God was telling me, just walk this way, Sammy, follow my lead. It might not seem efficient. It might seem like you don't understand it. You might not like it, but this trial is saving you from a devastating one. Here's what Pastor Jack knew. Sammy, you only know enough Bible to hurt yourself and others. You got so much pride in you. You got so much unrefinement in me. You need to go out there and get busted up. And you need to apply your Christian faith in the workforce more than the church house. You need to go. Ew, I would spend nine years. I, I had a lot to learn. Nine years. Nine years. Hear me. I don't believe I would be here this day if I would have tried to circumvent that trial and, 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 and met my match on the other one. God knew those men they were not ready for battle. They're gonna go back to Egypt if they face it. So I gotta take them on the long route. For somebody sitting in this room, God has you on the long route because he loves you. He loves you. But the second way God loves us is God loves us by surrounding us with people whose faith is bigger than ours. Listen to this. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. Check this out. Decades and decades and decades prior to Moses walking into Egypt, there was a man by the name of Moses, a man by the name of Joseph. Joseph knew that my forefathers and patriarchs of old spoke of this promised land, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph knew, I'm not gonna see it in my lifetime, but there's a forthcoming generation that will. I'm believing it because the promises of God are yes and amen. He upholds his covenant, he upholds his promises, and though I may not see it, I believe that you will. And so when you do, he made them swear an oath. You take my dead bones and you carry it into Canaan with you. I wanna go there. And so it was infused into Moses now, the faith of Joseph. And now because it was infused into Moses, it was infused into the people. So much so that though they didn't see it, they trusted in those that could. I am telling you right now, one of the most loving things God does for us is surrounds us by people whose faith is bigger than ours. So when we're going through a trial, we can lean on their perspective, not our own. When we fall into despair, depression, heartache, bewilderment, we're in our wilderness as many of you are. This is where the people of God rally around you. Those that are more seasoned, those that are more mature, those that are more experienced, those that have been through it and trusted God in the midst of it, that you can bank on their faith even when yours is running nil. This is what God does. He brings people around us. Listen to what it says about Joseph. We're gonna go back now to Genesis chapter 50. It says, Joseph stayed in Egypt. God raised him up through a myriad of trials. Trials, over and over again, it says, Joseph stayed in Egypt along with his father's family. He lived 110 years. 
and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children, also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh. 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 You say it how you want to. We're placed (laughs) at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid. And then you must carry my bones up out of this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110. And after that, they embalmed him and he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. That means when they got liberated, they went to that coffin. (laughs) They dug that man's bones up. They were like, "Let's, let's get after it. It's time to roll. We got Joe, and it's time to go. (laughs) I just made that up, Mom. (laughs) Hear me. I wouldn't be here. (laughs) We got Joe, and it's time to go. I like that. I wouldn't be here if I did not have men around me, women around me that saw God's purpose on me, that fanned it and encouraged it out of me. I mean, there's times that men and women, when I first got out of um, uh, Bible college and I did come home, oh, I was surrounded by people that would love on me, fan the gift of God in me, and then reprove me and rebuke me and tell the truth to me and say, that's a dope fiend move in you, Sammy. And that's the Sammy of old. That's not the, that's, that's not the new creation in there. You need to purge that, check that, be aware of that. These people loved me. They were more biblical than me. They had more perspective than me and they shaped me. Hear me, this is how God loves us through community. This is how God loves you by bringing people alongside of you that tell the truth to you. Just because somebody tells the truth to you doesn't mean that they're hating on you. Just because you're hearing something that you don't like or isn't causing you to feel comfy in your sin doesn't mean people are hating on you. Actually, they're loving you. If you don't like it when somebody else tells you, hey, you can't do that, you're probably gonna resist God when he tells you you can't do that. Why? Because God speaks through his people. So I know we love to cancel everybody and oh, you just gotta get on me, you know, and hey, nobody can judge me. Shut up. (laughs) If people didn't judge me, I wouldn't be here. They saw through all my shenanigans and said, I'm gonna call that out. Why? Because that is not God's best for you. Truth hurts sometimes. Truth makes you feel uncomfortable sometimes. And that's God's way of loving his children. He loves us, one, by giving us smaller trials to avoid devastating ones. He loves us by surrounding us with people whose faith is bigger than ours and that's truthful with us and that remembers God's promises. And then lastly, God loves us by giving us signs of his presence in the day and in the night. Can I tell you something right now? That God loves you so much that despite your awareness or the lack thereof, his activity is all around you. Many times our disposition is causing us to miss it. Don't you think for a moment that God is absent that if you get eyes wide open and you walk with the humility and a posture of the Lord speak for your servant is listening, you will see his fingerprint peppered all over your life, both day and night. It says this, after leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them and on their way, and by night, a pillar of fire to give them light. So they could travel by day or night, neither the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Some scholars conclude that the cloud and the pillar were one and the same. It was that they didn't notice the fire until the night fell. 
but that the fire stayed within the cloud. And not only was it provided for them by way of direction, it was provided for them by way of provision. That that fire would ultimately heat them as they traveled. They wouldn't have time to gather wood or create their own provision of fire. That fire would create illumination so that they could hunt and actually obtain food. That, that fire warded off all the enemies that would prey upon them. That fire wasn't just direction, it was provision and it was a type. It was a type of a foreshadowing of things to come, specifically the Holy Spirit. That there came a day where Jesus said, it's better that I go back to the Father so that I can send you the Holy Spirit that will never leave you and never forsake you, whether by day or by night. This is why Paul writes to the church at Philippi and he says that God will supply all your needs, all of them, all your needs, according to his riches and his glory. This is why First Peter says, he writes to the church and he says, according to his goodness, God has provided you everything that you need for life and godliness. There's nothing you lack, whether you're in the wilderness or you're on the mountaintop. This is why the psalmist says in Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord, follow his lead, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That no matter the day or the night, I've come to the awareness that when I was younger, I always thought that God only moved in the big situations or the big events or the grandiose experiences. Now, now I'm mindful by the grace of God. God's with me when I wake. He's with me when I'm taking my kids to school. His still small voice wants to speak to me. He wants to show me the blessings and provisions all around me. It might not not be everything I want. I want a whole bunch of dumb stuff. God's too good to give me what he knows would hurt me, but he's provided everything I need. That when you start to realize, wait a minute, I think my disposition is keeping me from seeing clearly and you remove it with a posture of humility, you start to see God wants to speak to you in dreams and in the evening. God wants to show you his protection and provision. God wants to show you that in the seasons of waiting, when you thought I could take the efficient, easier route, he was saving you for something and from something. God was with you in the day and in the night. Why? because he loves us too much to take his presence from us. Hear me, don't let your disposition miss the love of the Father. The enemy is a liar and he will try to deceive you so that you think I have to lead myself. He will try to convince you I can't trust God I gotta make things happen. He will try to conceive you, convince you, I shouldn't wait. I should just hurry up and do, do what I want. Hear me. And behind it lies a skull and crossbones, knowing that he's deceiving you and me right back into bondage. God's promises are yes and amen. And he loves us in ways that he wants us to see. And so Heavenly Father, today, we thank you for loving us. Many times, not the way we want, but the way we need. Thank you for being such a faithful, persevering, good, good Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word that shows us how it is that you wanna interact with us. Help us, Lord, as a community, as a church, to have hearts filled with gratitude and humility so that we can readily receive your love. Save us and protect us from ourselves, Lord. Our arrogance, our own leadership, our own haughtiness that would only lead us back into that which you've liberated us from. You are so good and we are so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for church today. Man, as we close out from such a powerful word that we just heard from Pastor Sammy, I just want to encourage you right now, wherever you find yourself, maybe you find yourself feeling close to God, perhaps distant from God. Maybe life is going really well right now, or perhaps you're in the midst of a really difficult challenge. We believe that wherever we're at in life, we all have a next step to take in the faith, that wherever you find yourself right now, we have a starting point from where we're at to where God would have you go. And so we want you to go to Church slash SP, short for starting point. If you're looking for that next step, if you're not sure where to go, perhaps it's baptism. We heard Pastor Sammy talk about baptism, and we've got that big baptism service coming up in just a short while. And so if you want to learn more about that next step, if you want to learn what it means to publicly declare your faith, to take that step that Jesus calls us to, maybe you're ready, maybe you want to learn more about how that works, that along with so much more is at lh.church slash sp. And as we close out, I do just want to take a moment, as we like to do here at the end of service, just to come together, just to lift up all of the needs, all the requests that are represented. I know as we've been streaming live, we've certainly seen some prayer requests come through in the comments. We've seen a request from Jason, who just mentioned, man, he's struggling a lot with anxiety, with stress right now. And I believe that's the case for so many. I know Lisa as well, she mentioned that she's struggling right now. She's feeling mentally drained. And so we certainly want to include these needs in our prayer here in a moment. Chloe mentioned that her mother, Cheryl, is being moved to hospice care, and we're so incredibly sorry to hear that. We certainly want to include your whole family in our prayer here in a moment. And Debbie had a little bit of praise that, you know, we've been praying for her family for a little while for relationships, and there's been some progress there, and we're so glad to hear that. She also requested that we keep Scott in prayer, and Lord knows the needs. We certainly want to keep Scott in prayer. And so those are some of the needs, some of the requests that are represented. Maybe there's more. Maybe there's one I didn't get a chance to read off. Or even as you're watching On Demand, I believe as we all come together right now, even at different times, that we could pause, we could lift up those needs, those requests that are present in our church family, in our community. And I would invite you right now, would you pray with us? Lord, we thank you for this chance to come together in so many different ways, from so many different locations, even in different times. And as we do that, we just want to lift up all these needs that are present. Certainly those ones I read off and all those other ones that we know are present, maybe even one on our own heart right now. Maybe it's unspoken. Lord, we just want to lift these things up to you. We want to give them to you. We want to seek you in so many different areas of life. I know many of us right now, we've mentioned that we're struggling with different things mentally. We're feeling stressed. We're feeling anxious. We're feeling depleted in so many different ways, Lord. We're struggling mentally. And so in all these different areas and all these different situations, these things that we're struggling with, we're just giving them to you. We're seeking you, Lord asking for your help, for peace that could only come from you, Lord, just that you'd help us to walk through these, that we'd feel your presence with us, that we'd know we're not alone, even in some of the most difficult things that we're walking through right now. When it comes to so many different health conditions of those of us around us, of us, Lord, it was, we give these things up to you. We just ask that you would be at the center of these. You'd guide our steps. You'd guide the steps of anyone else involved in care in these different things, Lord. And we just pray for your help in these different concerns. In so many different areas of life, Lord, we just want to seek you for direction, for wisdom, that we would seek your will. You'd show us the steps to take, Lord, and just in so many different ways that you'd help us in these things in a way that only you could. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, thank you so much for joining us. It's been so good to come together, and we cannot wait to see you again soon.